Hello everyone, uh, this is Ramesh Raskar, professor at uh, MIT, and welcome to our session on the satisfying zing of cryptocurrencies. Uh, and you know, cryptocurrencies are touted as the best tool for global trades, but banks seem to be wary. Some accept their trades, others refuse. Will COVID-19 accelerate the arrival of cryptocurrencies? Uh, what has to be done to ensure their safety? to deny their thefts, uh, and are they really going to revolutionize global trade or lead to a market crash? Uh, so, you know, uh, over the next 30, 40 minutes, we're going to look at, uh, you know, a whole bunch of issues uh, around cryptocurrencies. I'm really excited to see if uh, COVID-19 can play a, a critical role, uh, either in stimulating uh, the progress in cryptocurrencies or will cryptocurrencies finally have a you know a really decent application uh, when it comes to COVID-19. Um, so um, you know I'm going to start with uh, 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 I'm going to start with Steve uh, Steve Mead. Uh, welcome and uh, please introduce yourself. And I, um, all panelists will have their opening few minutes of of, uh, of comments, and then we'll jump into it. Thanks, and I think I see Paul here is trying to get in. A few other people. So I'll leave that to you, Ramesh, to, to handle the technical side. Okay. Uh, yeah, perfect. Stephen Mead, lifelong entrepreneur. I, I joke consistently that I've never had a job. Uh, and part of that is because I learned later on I'm unhirable. So quick little arc of history. Retail stores in college. Wrote three books when I was 20. I actually had, I think, the fourth ever infomercial on television called Give Yourself Credit. Uh, but the arc of my career started, I was 22. I went to work for Travelers Group, which was Sandy Wild, Pete Dawkins, Joe Plumeri, these kind of legends of the finance industry. And over six and a half years, I read 357 books, sales, psychology, motivation, you know, palm reading. I read everything I could get my hands on. And it was one book per week. And the goal was to dissect and create a, a program to train salespeople. And I did that. I created a 10-step program called a bullseye belief system. So everything I've done is use this system to target specifically and build companies. And since then, I've had 11 companies we've started. Three, we've actually had public uh, small cap OTC stuff in the United States. Five companies in the world. I'm actually the first one to have ever done something, which is kind of cool. It's a big statement. And people are always like, oh, well, what did you do? Quick example, 1996, I wanted to write a book. And I wanted to sell it on the internet. And I'd heard about these things called web pages. So I want somebody to build a website, process credit card orders, like my 800 number, send me checks and mailing labels. I wanted to talk on stage and cash checks. And in 96, it didn't exist. So we created a company, became the first master merchant in the world for credit card processing. Uh, took it public in 99. It was worth a billion dollars and watched it in 2000 be not worth a billion dollars. So it was kind of this interesting thing, but um, that technology is really what went on to become PayPal. So Homeland Security, we did in 01, mobile tech, and uh, relaunched something in 2000. I tried to build a global currency coming out of credit card processing, and nobody in the world understood global currencies. They, they asked all the wrong questions. So we kind of shelved that idea for 18 years, and to fast forward the relevance for today, 2018, I relaunched the same concept I tried to do before. We we launched a blockchain trading platform for corporate barter, $17 trillion industry, one of the largest industries in the world, never been automated, uh, and did a contest in Silicon Valley in 2018, the largest ICO blockchain contest in the world. Took first place out of 400 companies and went on. We won eight contests around the world in a year and a half in blockchain. And I so I bring a unique perspective. I've had three public companies. I've raised tens of millions of dollars. And then I understand how blockchain, crypto technology and platforms all work concurrently and conjectively, but they're also distinctively different. Uh, so with that, I'm hoping to, to add some value to everybody else who's watching in. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, let's see if we have uh, rest of our, our team. Um, so we'll wait for Paul uh, to join uh, in the meantime. Stephen, uh, let's Paul's asking to come in, Ramesh. He, I see it on my screen. I just don't know how to invite him. He may have to go in through the speaker link. 
Yeah, you'll have to open the the email for. So I already told him that. So okay, uh, perfect. Hopefully he'll. Um, um, hopefully he'll so join. What was the question? All right, we got Paul in here. Yeah, there we go. Um, uh, welcome, Paul. Uh, hey. How are you doing? If you can just apply crypto to all the AV problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most definitely. Uh, a big thank yeah. you to Dr. Frank Rick there for the invitation, and then very cool to connect with you guys on a fun subject. Excellent. Uh, so, Paul, uh, w welcome. First of all, uh, you know you have done some amazing work in this space. Uh, your opening comments. Tell us who you are and why you're excited about uh, crypto, its applications to COVID-19, uh, and its scalability. Yeah, lifelong entrepreneur, much like uh, Steve over there. And uh, with crypto, you know, you gotta love the distribution of the blockchain and how it really democratic uh, creates a uh, democratic process for the entire world on uh, something that's very instant, but also very cheap. So that's the cool thing about the crypto space. Right, right. Fantastic. Just tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization. Yeah, no, I, I run an investment fund uh, and we, we've created a lot of uh, companies within the cloud space and also in the blockchain space as well. Yeah. Can you can you just tell us a little bit more, the names, the geography, yeah, the, size, yeah. the timeline yeah. and so on? <laughs> all, all, all out of New York City, uh, Rio Digital is my cloud infrastructure. It's a hyper cloud company. And also we have a, uh, a blockchain company named uh, Wall Street Enterprises that'll be hitting market uh, this year. Fantastic, uh, fantastic. So um, I think some of the questions we are discussing here are, you know, um, Will COVID-19 accelerate the arrival of such cryptocurrencies? Uh, and my personal interest is, will cryptocurrencies play a significant role uh, in taming this uh, pandemic, either from a public health point of view or from a kind of economic point of view, right? Um, and you know, we, when we hear about kind of contactless transactions, it's a big deal now, suddenly, right? Uh, but that's just kind of the last mile aspect of it, the physical transactions. Um, but is there a role uh, for crypto to play when you think about concepts like exposure notification and contact tracing you know privacy is playing a very big role um, and you know one of the promised land for cryptocurrencies uh, is you know some kind of a privacy uh, and of course friction and and uh, and uh, you know the costs uh, so let me pose that as the first question do you think you do you see do you wake up a day every day and say wow covid 19 there's something i can do here you want, I'll take a run at it, Paul. The the challenge with that question, Ramesh, is that there, there were fortunately and unfortunately about 11 questions in there that would all need to be unpacked separately. Um, so I'll just I'll just take the first one. Will COVID-19 accelerate cryptocurrency? I, I'm, I'm sort of a contrarian. I believe in something called retrospective evolution. First off, I don't think most of the cryptocurrencies are actually currencies. To me, they're glorified penny stocks. They're a tradable asset. People buy Ripple at 28 cents and hope to sell it at 70. They don't buy it thinking they're going to pay for coffee. So I, I think the world's conflated a lot of issues. I also don't think there's much difference between a debit card as a digital settlement and whether or not you use Bitcoin or something else. So in my opinion, COVID's going to accelerate the use of digital because the governments would love to get rid of fiat, cash, and coins where they can more accurately track you for taxes, whether that's direct deposit to a debit card or whether it's some form of stable card from your or stable credit from your bank or credit. The, the only difference, and I'll finish with this, if I own Bitcoin and Bitcoin's going up or down, I can pay with that. If Schwab or somebody wanted to attach my Amazon stock to a debit card and let me pay and settle like a the, the, the crypto stuff to me is such a misnomer. I think it's really, it's done a disservice to the industry. But I think it's going to accelerate the elimination of some fiat currencies because governments would rather track us. I mean, and you're saying, and, and you're saying um, I'm trying to make some connection to the today's world. You're saying that the fact that you can track uh, the transactions is a bigger incentive for governments than reducing friction, reducing it, exchange costs. It, it, I'll, I'll answer real quick, and then I'd, I'd love for Paul and these guys. In the U.S., 40% of the economy is service-related, which is 
restaurants, salons, things like that, which are also a cash business. So cash services, tips, there's an entire segment of the economy the government would love to have to go through a debit card with direct deposits so they can tack tips to the waiter. Tip Like there's a, a tracking taxability issue that the government would love to get their hands around and eliminating quarters all of a sudden, you know, where you can't get change is the first step of trying to move everything digital. It doesn't have to be crypto. They would love for it to be digital tracking, whether that's a debit card, a stable card, or your currency. Fantastic. Uh, Paul, let's hear from you, and then uh, we'll also introduce our uh, speaker. Paul, go ahead about uh, COVID-19 and, and cryptocurrencies. Yeah, definitely the traceability aspect, I think, uh, helps the cost for crypto and um, the way the blockchain works. That I think it's it re really would be a, a good solution for upcoming COVID uh, spread. You know, it would be a great way of really creating a uh, an analytical approach to COVID and, and being able to solve it in a, in a certain manner. It's less disruptive than everybody stay at home and, and just work from home only. Yeah. I think that's, that's a much better application for it. And um, on, on the currency side, I, uh, again, like like Steve, I, I don't view it as a currency, but it really is a digital asset. So it's digital gold. I mean, there's a trust behind it and there's economies out there, not just, you know, not, not the U.S., but during the economies where the currency is not worth much value, where Bitcoin is more valuable than um, a certain currency and maybe more stable so and more secretive um, and you know some some areas right now of the world if you look at Lebanon where people can't even take money out of their own banks you know it's, it's a good time to own Bitcoin and use it um, as, as a stored value that you can actually trade yeah that's uh, that's that, those are very important points uh, Benjamin Dahl is here welcome uh, and, uh, you know, as you know, we are talking about Thank you. Crypto, COVID, stability, uh, scalability, uh, and so on. So uh, welcome, first of all. And if you can just introduce yourself and tell us who you are so uh, for, our, for, our, for our audience. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Benjamin Dahl and has had a perfect connection until five minutes before the, the, the talk, unfortunately. Um, so first of all, I'm... I'm Foremost and, and early adopter and, and uh, with a avid passion uh, around the possibilities of uh, decentralized networks of, of trust, basically. And I would like to, to to step back and and you know talk about why we're here today and why we're talking about this right now. And it was because of um, the introduction and release of an open internet protocol uh, to the world in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis and as a response to that. And much like the IMAP for, for sending email or uh, DNS for domain names, this one is, is for the transfer of value. And in terms of functionality uh, and judging by the universal scrutiny that has been put upon this uh, new open internet protocol, you know, nothing can get close to, to compete in many senses. Uh, if you look at, at the downtime for, for said uh, protocol, uh, I think today it's been 2,761 days since the, uh, since the network was, was down. And most banks count that in a, in a couple of days. Um, before they restart the clock, like if you don't know, knew, right? Yeah. And it's this resilience that is that has gained so much uh, traction and and pushed efforts to to uh, replicate, add, improve, and build on top of that security um, yeah. that is open for everyone to to, to assess. Um, and you know. That has sparked this this whole blockchain and crypto space race that we're seeing right now. Um, and if um, if I were to to um, you know say something in in terms of where we want to go, uh, you know we we need to get our countries to to open up and to encourage uh, open source development and innovation um, on top of of this network. You know, it's been so politi 
politicalized. Um, so, yeah, it, it's it's um, you know it's not about building your own uh, ecosystem like it was not about building your own internet. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I think the decentralization uh, is, is certainly a key there. But decentralization also brings, you know, a lot of issues of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, a trust and theft and leakage and, and so on. Uh, and it seems like, uh, you know, when are we going to mature? Uh, so decentralization on Internet has created its own problems. Uh, and we just want to inherit all those problems of, of decentralization, or we think we're going to be, uh, we're going to learn from the challenges. IMAP is a good example, how easy it is to spoof. <laughs> um, so any thoughts on that? How are we learning? Are we using, are we using the right analogy here? Is the internet the right analogy? Or there are better analogy like Swift or something like that? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in again, just for, for brevity. Again, because I've, I've had three public companies, so I understand the aspect of, managing shareholders, corporate theft. We've got free trading shares that were out there that we didn't know where they came from. So when you look at a public company, which is where crypto tokens are really a, an extension of that, you look at the trackability of cash with serial numbers. We've actually just filed a patent and I'm not doing it because I want to block anybody out. I just want the, the industry to be more secure. We found a way to serialize tokens at the actual issuance number and level, looking at it almost like a stock certificate where every certificate, every token can become serialized. So then if something gets stolen, crypto itself doesn't get stolen. Bitcoin's never been hacked. The exchanges have been hacked, which is like the banks being robbed in the 1800s. So security has to get better at the exchanges, but this movement of tokens and stuff, I still think can be private but trackable where if I know here's the, all of the serial numbers of the tokens I own and something gets stolen, you need technology and ways to reclaim some of that, but still maintain privacy and anonymity. So again, retrospective evolution to me is what's worked in the past, but how do we move new technologies to make the industry better, stronger, faster, and grow, but people still need to feel comfortable. There still has to be safety and security and protocols while still maintaining transparency and, and decentralization. So, so Stephen, uh, you know what? Um, who has the authority to to uh, to uh, take money or or to to freeze uh, money that that is, um, um, you know, who has the, this is authority? I think you're on mute. I, um, it's a good question. And I know Paul's in New York. So the way I looked at it, Paul, is we're finishing a token round, which to me is like a direct public offering. But if yeah. I offer that to my particular token holders or community, some people may need to hold it for six or 12 months. Some people may get in at a discount. I want to be able to track the efficacy of my actual shareholders to make sure they aren't doing something. So it's it's not the other side. It was me as a company wanting to have protocols around if I offer you a token at a discount in the real world, it's called a pipe, a public inv or private investment, public equity. If I give you a discount and you're supposed to hold it for six or 12 months, I don't want you selling that fictitiously on an exchange and liquidating. So in, in the, in the stock world, you've got lockup six and 12 months, but you've got free trading shares. What happens a lot of times is guys get, a hold of these free trading shares and you don't know those blocks are there and they're selling into the market and driving your price. Like I want to stop the manipulation, not control the environment. I'm trying to add protocols that make the environment safer moving forward. So yeah. for us, it was an issuance where we were serializing. We serialize the wallets for all of our investors. So we delivered directly to a target wallet. We know they received it. And then we're serializing tokens delivered to them so we can track them out through the network if we want to. I, I think uh, as Stephen was uh, pointing out, really what, what he's been able to do from what he's saying um, from from the offset of the original Bitcoin to now what he's saying is like a, a crypto equity, basically. Um, yeah. You're going in in a more responsible manner. I mean, we had a utopia with ICOs, but, you know, nothing really panned out correctly. So 
if we could blend that into a hybrid, still keep uh, everything cool with the SEC and not have any issues with them, but also safeguard, number one, investors, but also founders, then you have something that's of a, a very high intrinsic value uh, compared right. to just trying to get onto the stock market, which which is usually a longer road anyway. And I, I think that's, that's the number one thing that really uh, Bitcoin really offered was the ability to invest in any startup around the whole world instantly. Yeah, but the challenge, Paul, becomes the dilution capability and aspect of the founders. In an ICO world, if I say I'm only selling 20 million tokens, there's no guidance that I'm not in the background selling more. In the OTC world, it's dilution. People are diluting the shareholder base. So if things are serialized, you can actually have audits. I just I want better control so more people are comfortable investing in the new industries in, in ways that make sense. I'm not trying to limit anything. So I want the patent there only to provide security for the industry that says, oh, hey, we do have better audit trails to protect the investors, to assure the project. You know, the, the crypto to me is the, is the token side. It's not a currency side. It's an equity asset to, that democratizes investment around the world. You know, a, a guy in Bangladesh can't buy a 1800 stock of Amazon but he can buy $180 worth of Bitcoin in the percentages. Like the, I tell people, don't look at the price. Price of Bitcoin's irrelevant. Buy whatever amount you can and look at the percentage of what it moves. Your $50 worth of Bitcoin goes up as much as the guy that buys $500,000. So it's, I love the democratization side of it. I just want stability and comfort where more people come in the industry. And also, if you if you look at what happened with crypto was... Before crypto, before Bitcoin, there was no smart way of onboarding mobile investors. You know, before uh, all this, we had old school desktop applications and everybody was using E-Trade. And then that and stock along. and crowdfunding and, and the Jobs Act didn't. There, there, the, crypto's democratizing investments for startups in one half and investments for 98 percent of the world, in my opinion, doesn't have access to buying, you know, Apple or Amazon, but they can buy a percentage of something, whether it's Bitcoin as, as a gold unit or a crypto they want to invest in or a company they want to participate in. It's it's a democratization that still needs some protections because it's like the early days of the Internet. You, you asked that, Ramis. So there's a bunch of companies that went public. You know, we were one. We went public in 99. We were worth a billion dollars and then we weren't. It, it, it wasn't anything other than market dynamics, but you can manipulate things and the SEC tries to stop that. The, the industry just needs more. It needs more structure for it to grow in a way that protects everybody. No, not, not regulation, not controls that way, just stability. You need better onboarding for consumers to have mobile apps. You need better ways for them to come on and actually acquire crypto and understand what it is, not where we are right now with the conflation. Yeah, I, I think that's where you'll see the maturity in, in like the next generation of uh, of crypto backed companies. Um, you know, wh whether it's the, the equity side and um, using Bitcoin as an option because that's what it's going to become at some point, not really a default, but really uh, safeguarding uh, your investors, which which is what didn't happen with ICOs. And that's, that's kind of yeah. why uh, the SEC kind of hammered on them. And uh, that kind of gave, you know, crypto a, a, a black eye because it was this beautiful utopia of hey, founders with great ideas get invested right away. And the road to money was much faster and the velocity was much wider than uh, taking VCs that just want to load debt on you anyway. So I, I thought that that was like the, the value that Bitcoin possessed that really um, kind of opened up guys like Steve and I's eyes that said, hey, we, we can make this thing into something better into the future. Definitely, definitely. And Go ahead, ben. Um, might I say the 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 politicization the, the politicization of of Bitcoin uh, is is a big problem uh, that people see it as uh, force it into uh, an investment or 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 a, a, an asset class or or a currency. Um, that is for me the the one of the biggest uh, uh, problems because you know. Technology is is agnostic, and uh, uh, you know we um, it's not money 
that is the killer application for the Bitcoin network. It, it, it is the trust. It is the fact that it has had the, the worst possible uh, uh, circumstances for uh, uh, trying to survive um, since, its, since its start. And it's the, the network is more secure than ever. And the, the fact that uh, if you want to close down this network, you have to close down the whole internet. And even if you do that, uh, we have full nodes right now in orbit around the world. Um, and, and so the, the, the resilience is what I think is, is, um, is important. And that can be leveraged by something that, that has nothing to do with crypto, that has nothing to do uh, you know, with, with internet money. Um, it's just the base layer of, of security. And um, yeah, that's what yeah. um, gets me excited. If, yeah. if I can answer something real quick, Benjamin and, and DePaul, these are separate and I'll be quick. One, I love this. I, I've given a speech for almost two years called Unblocking the Blockchain. And people look at me with Mineta Pro. We have a, a marketplace. They're like, are you a blockchain company? And I say, are you an internet company? Just because you use the website doesn't make you an internet company. We're using blockchain as a technology to update asset modules. I'm using the blockchain. So I explain blockchain's the fundamental technology, just like the internet. The internet runs e-commerce and online bill pay and virtual chat. So I tell the businesses we deal with, especially in New York, I said, look at how the internet either displaced processes or disrupted them. And blockchain will do the same. Like blockchain to me is going to displace a lot of processes, disrupt them, but it's not an, a, a technology. It's not an industry. It's the technology. And then the way we structured our token real quick, Paul, is we are doing an equity round because we have corporate investors. And then we separated out a liquidity token out of Malta that's divorced from the equity. And we hold it in a treasury wallet where we don't deliver it to the investor until they want it in the future. So we found a legal way because I like the, the aspect of democratizing investments in the company, but it's really a speculative token. So we create a legal structure to leverage traditional equity and the accelerated liquidity into the market. But I want that structure around it where people are more comfortable. So we've done some cool things legally with the way we structured, you know, some of the, the corporate stuff. Yeah. Let's let's uh, fascinating uh, points there um, about what is fundamental and what's the vertical. So. Paul, as I said, like people think blockchain is the vertical, but blockchain is the horizontal, right? Um, so given that, um, uh, is it, are cryptos going to become a platform for a global trade or is it going to become a yet another factor uh, in terms of the fragility of the financial system? I think that it already became a platform for global trade, right? I think that's really what happened. And um as, as Steve said, you know, he's doing work in Malta. Would you have ever been able to do work in Malta before Bitcoin? I mean, let's be serious here. I think the security side of Bitcoin and the trust of the network really said, you know what, we could do business without boundaries. And that's, that's really what they still it was have their, They still have their issues, but it's, it's, it's a little different. Malta's always had issues to the 1500s, but yeah, go ahead. So that's kind of what, that's what it did, right? It, it really became a, a universal way of doing business. And not having limitations of certain governments, you know, telling you not to send money certain at certain times somewhere and really not getting politicized in business. That's really what it was about. Um, but again, it's not perfect. You know, that's the one yeah. thing about it. I don't pretend it is, but it really was, you know, something that was visionary and, and gained a lot of traction. It wasn't just this thing where there was just a bunch of smart people telling each other really complicated stuff. It, it became something that became useful into uh, in, even until now when, when I was speaking to friends in, in Latin countries where there's no currencies, you know, the fiat's not working, it's not of value. And if it wasn't for Bitcoin, they wouldn't be able to power the lights on or even uh, eat any food. And that, that's, you know, those are some of the takeaways of the asset itself and the value of its asset. Yeah, there's, to, to me, there's, there's three different things. One, we're in which we built a closed system Mineta Pro is a closed network, meaning a company lists assets, trade it, 
gets a ledger credit and uses it to buy something else. We're not even on blockchain. We're an internal financial settlement engine. But to me, everything I do is B2B. So what Paul's talking about is exactly right. But that to me is the consumer side of where it falls. On the business side, if I wanted to send Benjamin $25,000, which he'll probably put his account up for me, I have to go to the bank, fill out paperwork, pay $30 for the privilege of sending my money. I have to be to two o'clock cutoff. Still takes two days to get there through Swift Fedwire because everybody sits on the money. Then Paul's got to, or, or Benjamin's got to, you know, spend 20 or 30 bucks for the privilege of receiving money I'm sending to him. I could send him Bitcoin and it'll get there in 20 minutes without the fee. The challenge is businesses can't work on Bitcoin because it fluctuates. I can't send a $5 million transaction and have it drop 8% in 20 minutes when it gets to the network. So the crypto for me for trade is exactly what's going on. JP Morgan's finishing their stable coin. If I have $50,000 in my bank account, I'll convert it to a JP Morgan token, which is going to be on Stellar. I think they're building three. That'll run across the network to Wells Fargo in 20 minutes as a digital asset. And it'll be in Benjamin's Wells Fargo account as a WFT on the Ripple protocol. And if he needs cash, he'll up it into his fiat account for a small fee. So global trade's going to increase because if we call it crypto, that's fine. I'd rather call it digital settlement. The, the blockchain component accelerates settlement where Swift, Fedwire, and ACH cannot do it. But the banks are still going to be those intermediaries where it's just going to be the bridge in between that will allow us to down convert digital tokens, send across stable, up convert its fiat in his account. So the consumer side's one, but the corporate side is really a completely different one that's trillions of dollars. It's going to change the way processes are done. And I, and I actually think um, on the digital front for, for the enterprise approach um, towards the near future, it, it kind of creates a, a banking department in every enterprise. Mm -hmm. so it, it's not just accounting any longer. It, it would be more banking. And when you have more sophisticated uh, software is outfitted for, for business approach only, then you're going to see more companies uh, doing the things that maybe, you know, JP Morgan's were doing for them. And some of their services exactly. are going to be obsolete at some point. They'll have direct accounts, Paul. I agree with you. They'll have direct accounts where that $5 million will go directly into their wallet. They control it. Then they'll use that as CMS, treasury management. They'll leave that crypto in there, that stable, decide if they want to trade it up or not, just like they leave cash in in a sweep account to earn interest. Like the acceleration of blockchain is going to give companies whole new process tools that are going to make it more efficient. That, that's where, the to me, it's the exciting part of retrospective evolution. What's it going to allow you to do better, faster, cheaper, and more efficiently? Uh, ben, if you have any thoughts, but I also want to, this notion that certain aspects of the economy uh, could be transformed uh, is a given. Um, but does that remain fringe examples or does it become come to the center? And to come to the center, do we have issues with fragility and robustness? Um, I, th I think that the, the uh, main selling point for these systems is the, the, the robustness. And, uh, but, you know, there's a trade-off uh, as with anything. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is um, uh, talking about, uh, Stephen uh, mentioned uh, perfection. I mean, th that is... Uh, uh, that is always something that is just perceived. There is no, you know, such thing. Yeah. And say with security, it's the perceived security, um, and so um, uh, I'll yeah. answer something, Benjamin, if I can. And, and yeah, Ramesh, could, could you read? Because again, I like I, I, I tend to want to fight the perception of people who don't know what they're talking about. Unfortunately, that's a lot of times people in the industry. And so I'll give one quick example is because again, I built merchant accounts. I understand credit card processing. I understand the interchange and how many people make money and all of, when people go, oh, Bitcoin's slower. Visa can do a million transactions a minute and Bitcoin can only do X. There, there's a difference and I say, that's not true. 
authentication occurs at the merchant level. You walk in and swipe your credit card. The Visa networks authenticate you're good for the money. Then it rides across the network and it hits the merchant's bank account two days later minus the fees. Mm -hmm. It doesn't settle. Bitcoin and crypto settles in 20 minutes. So it effectively settles much quicker than the Visa network. So they're false comparables where people are like, oh, it's slow. It'll never compete. They're, 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 the perceptions are wrong because people don't know what they're talking about. It's authentication is completely different than settlement. But you've got fluctuation that you have to deal with. And, and so you've got the BitPays of the world that are just, they're all BitPays is a glorified Bitcoin merchant, like a glorified credit card company. Like the world just needs better messaging for it to move forward. It's not that complicated, but the perception is, oh, you're a blockchain. Oh, you're a crypto company. I, like it's, it's a, it's a frustrating fight that I fight. I'm sure you guys do too. So. Yes. Stephen, you spoke about the, the volatility being a, a problem, and that's, um, you know, across the, the board. Uh, and, you know, how does the, the, the traditional finance industry uh, solve uh, that problem? Um, you know, if the price gets too high too quick, you do a stock split. And, you know, most people don't, uh, don't think about it or, or don't realize know what that is is the effect of a a a, a stock or an asset uh, getting cheaper but but you know it's getting diluted um but but what it makes is it makes a, a very nice price curve uh on a linear scale and we don't have that option in in uh, in, in crypto you know it's uh Set in stone is, is the wrong uh, word, but it's it's setting code, um, you know, scarcity, uh, the, the the idea. And I want to um, go ahead. I want to ask you, uh, ask you all the 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 implications of um, the reintroduction to to scarcity as an idea, uh, because that's that is something that I don't think we've um, experienced in. Um, if 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 ever to to me I'll, i'll take it first shot paul is that okay yeah go for it yeah benjamin to me you just conflated about three different things so you asked how does the industry compete if i'm sending you 10 million dollars in cash these companies are set up for hedge and arbitrage because if that currency drops a point or two in the two days it takes to settle they have to hedge and arbitrage against currency so fluctuation for settlement is there If I gave you as a philanthropy a million dollars worth of Amazon stock, you as a philanthropy have to decide, do you sell the stock now? Do you keep it? Do you think Amazon's going to go up? If I send you Bitcoin, it's the same thing. You have to decide what to do to manage that risk. The stable coins take risk of settlement out. It just accelerates. So the the what you're talking about with stock price, I think is cool. That's where I always talk about You can't buy, well, with Robinhood now, you can buy slices of an Amazon stock. But a brick of gold's $500,000, a gold coin's fifty, but they go up the same. A Bitcoin unit's $10,000, but you could buy $10, they go up and down the same. So they're, they're, they're sort of different, they're, they're different lanes all leading to the same solution of how do we get paid quicker. Yeah, and, and you know, that is in relation to uh the 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 not uh, being able to to smoothen out uh, out the, the 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 price curve this because this is all you know perception and and uh, uh on a chart what what i'm speaking of it's not well, but bitcoin bitcoin and crypto is going to fluctuate just like a stock if i sent you a million dollars in amazon sure. stock it's going a stable coin's not going to fluctuate it's going to fluctuate against the dollar so they're they're different solutions for different problems yes So, uh, you know, I, I, I encourage uh, I encourage some of the participants uh, and attendees to post their questions. Uh, I know, Paul, you already answered the question about uh, serialization. Uh, let's come back to this topic of 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 stability and intention of governments. And I think the analogy Paul you're giving about uh, about dollar, uh, Steve, the analogy made about dollar stable coin, you know, doesn't apply to other. Currencies, so I should be able to take you know, the most unstable 
uh, country in the world and should be able to create something stable for them. Um, so let's let's talk about what's the interest for governments, uh, whether they're uh, in a well-intentioned or ill-intentioned, but still create something that's stable that the population can use and also make it interoperable, not just through exchanges, but interoperable in a true, true sense, uh, you know, across the borders for them. Yeah, I think I think if you look at uh, any government's message, it, it's always for the better. It's never for the worse. No. But uh, if if we look at uh, what they're going to do with it, I mean, I I think I think yeah, I think I think uh, you could have a more seamless tax structure on uh, on credit card purchases and, and debit card purchases. But I think at, still at the end of the day, you're, you're going to need a a cash mechanism, whether it's it's a it's a crypto manner of, of actually utilizing the cash structure itself where there's an anonymous manner of, hey, it's none of your business. It's your currency, yes, but it's your cash. But, you know, I don't have to report it unless, you know, there, there's a certain metric or law that says I have to. And I think you can't get away from that, right? I think that's that's the whole uh, reasoning of having cash in the first place because I think maybe the government might be in trouble if, if we track all the money. So. I, I think that that might be uh, something that's not going to ever go away, but it, it will be retooled in, in a more crypto-friendly uh, form. This yeah. is for, for me real quick, because this gets back to what Paul was saying also. Uh, and Benjamin, a friend of mine who was a former congressman, saw an article and said, oh, this particular state in the U.S. is now accepting Bitcoin for tax payment. And he called me. He's like, how's this work? Explain it to me. And I told him his name's Dennis. I said, Dennis, they're not taking Bitcoin. Bitcoin's going to BitPay. BitPay's converting it to cash and they're taking cash. So BitPay's, t- Bit- BitPay's taking it at a certain price, converting that and paying the state in cash. The state can't take $25,000 in Bitcoin and have that fluctuate. So there, there's why I was talking about the difference is, uh, you know, you can accept Bitcoin, but as a business, somebody's taking the risk converting it to cash because companies like stability so I think there's a marriage of both. It's how do you take it in, convert it if you need cash? If you want to hold the risk of fluctuation, you can, but not all companies can do that. And we can. We we took our early investment dollars at Ethereum 900. Ethereum tri- dropped to 450 and we're trying to decide do we keep it or sell like it's it's tough managing investments in crypto, but I've had companies in our nonprofit give us cash or not cash, they gave us stock. And we had to do the same thing. Do we hold the stock? Do we set like it's it, there? There's a lot of parallels. We just have to think them through. Yeah. All right. We are almost up on time. Uh, ben, uh, each of you, last 30 seconds of your general so, thoughts, COVID-19, cryptocurrencies. A quick so shout out to, to, yeah. um, to uh, a, a trend that I've been seeing getting getting stronger is, is the corporate uh, interest and in, in speaking to, um, to the fact of volatility um you know that that can go the the, the right way uh, as well and um, as micro strategy uh, has done and convinced their investors uh, to do is is to see that um limited downside and and uh almost unlimited um upside uh in terms of you know if we're going to hold uh, cash, they now see it is as too volatile, um, the US dollar almost. Uh, so it's a big uh, it's change in the, in the market and it's um, amazing to see and um, interesting time to be alive. Yep. Yeah, we are up on time. I think we're going to get cut off in about 20 seconds. So really appreciate all of you joining this important session on the satisfying the thing of uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Ben. And all our all our attendees, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thank Bye. you very much. All right, how do we sign off? Are we out? Yeah, I think so. But Paul, reach connect with me when you can. I'm trying to make it out to New York. All my my BlackRock guys are opening back up. Salt, Scaramucci, Sky, like the investment world's finally slowly opening. Sure, uh, so I'm yeah. hoping to make my way back out there. Yeah, yeah. No, and no, I, I encourage you to send us a send me a ping. Uh, you know, we'd like to keep you on the things we do at MIT as well. A lot of work going on in this space, of course. 
Yeah, yeah, perfect. yeah. If you ever need a guest speaker, let me know. I'll I'll zoom in for the students. <laughs> definitely, definitely. No, you, I know, I know we need people who have been in the field, so this is this is excellent. Yeah. I have some All right. things up there too. I'll I'll connect with you guys. Bye bye. Okay. See you guys. Thanks a lot.